Beautiful. All right. Happy Monday, everybody. Um, hopefully, if you're watching this, you know that I'm Seth David, and I'm your friend to the end. Um, no, this is something I wanted to start doing more regularly. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I felt that it was long overdue. Uh, so we're calling this Monday Night Madness, just where I want to share a few of my thoughts on things based on how to build your CFO and advisory service, and specifically the how, not the what. I know you already know the what. I know you've heard the what beaten to death. So I want to talk about the how. I want to talk about how to do this. So please, of course, as we are, we're going on here, please post your comments below. I'm going to try and you know, peek in at the feeds here. I've got uh, the feed going on my page here at the Nerd Enterprises business page, as well as in the Facebook group. Accounting Business Academy. If you're not in the Facebook group, request to join the Facebook group at Accounting Business Academy. And if you're, if you haven't liked my business page, then please go like my business page, right? So we're crisscrossing between the two. So um, what do I want to talk about? First of all, I need to mute my live feeds because I keep hearing myself and it's extremely distracting. Um, so that should take care of that. Um, so let's talk. I really want to know your feedback, your comments. A while back, I posted something in the Facebook group asking like who out of those of you who are out there, you know, really wants to go from compliance to advisory work, you know, where you're kind of, and, and here's the typical scenario, you know, you've, you've, you've got a mature accounting or bookkeeping practice. You've been at this for a while. Maybe you're doing between 10 and 20,000 a month in revenues. And it seems like no matter how hard you try, you just can't break through that plateau. And the, and the reason simply put is because what it took to get you to that level is not what it's going to take to get you to the next level, which let's just define as, you know, working towards a goal of doing, you know, let's say somewhere between 50 and a hundred thousand a month. That's a real good sweet spot. And the way we do that is by offering a high ticket offer, which comes in the form of CFO and advisory services, right? So I want to start talking about that. I want to start talking about this every week. I'm going to jump on live here on Monday nights at 6 PM Pacific time. So we can talk about this stuff, right? So, you know, we want to talk about how to go advisory, right? What does that look like, right? So let's start by analyzing financial statements, okay? Most clients put too much emphasis on the P&L and not enough emphasis on the balance sheet, right? And so here's a question for you. How often do you review your balance sheet with your client? Live, one-on-one, -on -one, or many, in a Zoom, together, like at the same time, right? And some of you may be already be doing this, but there's a trick to this. The devil's in the details, right? A, this needs to be your Zoom. You need to own it, right? And you want to make sure you record it. And they, your client, needs to share their screen with you while you do this. In other words, they need to share their screen. They need to pull up the reports so that you can review the reports with them. Your Zoom, you record the session and send them the recording afterwards. They share their screen with you so they stay engaged. That's the trick to this. Otherwise, you can be sharing your screen and go over their balance sheet while they're on Instagram cleaning photos of really cute puppies, right? So we wanna make sure they're engaged, which is why it's a very subtle little detail, but a very important one that they need to be sharing their screen, engaged in their own reports and you're reviewing it with them. Also, this empowers them when they start learning how to navigate the screens as you take them through the balance sheet. Uh, some clients are more comfortable than others, of course, but if you're dealing with a client who's not really comfortable, you know, in the financial software and they're thinking, oh, I don't know anything about accounting, this will help them get comfortable. Your job, remember, is to make the client feel safe. And one of the ways you're going to make them feel safe is to get them comfortable with navigating a little bit around QuickBooks Online. They don't need to become accountants or bookkeepers, but they should be comfortable. And if you happen to be watching this and you're the business owner, then just, you know, heed my words from your perspective. You want to get comfortable reviewing the balance sheet and P&L. And, and if you're out there, you reach out to your accountant and ask them to do what I'm suggesting to my other accounting and bookkeeping friends to do right now. Um, now, I don't care if you request control uh, and take over at some point to save time, but you should, the client should be doing most of the driving in terms of navigating around QuickBooks. Now, I can teach you a lot of tools that you can use to set up a process for this. Uh, but before we do anything CFO related, of course, we need to make sure the books are bulletproof. This process doesn't just ensure 
that for you, it also boosts your client's confidence in you. And that's really, really important, right? Because as your client and you together are going through the books, they're going to see how accurate and how, how much everything makes sense. Or if something they think doesn't look right, first of all, in my experience, a lot of the times if the client says something doesn't look right, usually means something probably isn't right, right? And it could be just something misclassified. But when you're working with them on it and they see how quickly and easily, because you've got the books reconciled and dialed in and bulletproof, they see how quick and easy it is for you to jump in there and make a quick, you know, classification correction, you know, moving something from one account to another. Again, it gives them confidence that the books are tight, that nothing's missing, and, and, and that it's very easy to rearrange things as needed when we're, again, talking about things that are just a matter of classification. Um, so let's look at a simple example, right? Let's do something very practical. I'm going to share my screen and kind of pull up the, uh, the test drive company. Just checking to see if there's any comments so far. I guess not. So we're, we're going to pull up the QBO test drive company. And I'm just going to kind of rip through the balance sheet. I'm going to do this quickly. You can, I, you know, of course, watch the replay of this, you know, in case you want to kind of go through things more slowly. Most of you, I expect, know what you're doing. So this is just kind of a review of what I suggest you do first and foremost before you can really begin to start advising your clients on anything that's based on their financial information. We want to make sure we review that financial information and make sure that we're comfortable, that the client is comfortable, that it's accurate. And like I said, if you get in the habit of reviewing these financials on some kind of an, a regular interval with the client, it's just, it's going to strengthen the relationship on so many levels. Um, and it's going to get you much more intimately acquainted with their business and what's going on in their business and them much more intimately acquainted with the value of what you offer as the accountant or bookkeeper on this. So let's go. This, the balance sheet on this company is pretty simple. So it'll be quick to review. But I just want to talk through this a little bit and explain how I look at this because that's one of the pieces of feedback I get from a lot of people, a lot of you, that you know, what to me seems sort of normal and obvious when I share it to a lot of you, it's like, oh, I never thought of it that way. And sometimes I have to remind myself that my brain works a little differently, I think, sometimes. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes maybe not so good. But uh, the point is I, I want to take nothing for granted and I want to walk you through my thought process uh, and what that looks like as I'm going through something like this. So the first thing, of course, is looking at the bank accounts. We want to check are these reconciled, right? When was the last time they were reconciled? And what I'll often do so as not to lose my place is of course I'll duplicate this tab and, and then we'll just jump in and we'll do a quick check on the bank recs, right? So of course we're gonna go right over into the gear icon over to the reconcile screen and it's giving me that because it's a sample company, right? But over here, if the account had been reconciled before, there would be a date. And for that matter, if anything had been done to upset the reconciliations, deleting a reconciled transaction or marking something reconciled that shouldn't have been, right, or changing the amount of a reconciled transaction, those of you who have been using QBO for a minute know that you would see that error indicated here. And the first thing we need to do is fix that or anything like it. Of course, if this was a real client's file and I'm looking at it, I would say, whoa, this has never been reconciled before. There's no reconciliation history. The fact that there's a beginning balance always concerns me when there's no reconciliation. Usually what it means is we linked up the bank feeds. And when we do nowadays, QuickBooks Online sticks whatever the beginning balance is as of the day, as far back as the bank feeds can go. And it, it sticks it in there as opening balance equity. So what I do is I immediately go in and, and remove that entry, right? So if we go to history by account, there's no history, right? There's no reconciliation history, but I'll go to the bank register and I'll find that $5,000 entry. And see, that's exactly what it does when we set up the bank feeds. So if we set up the bank feeds and the farthest back they could go at the time we set it up was April 19th of this year. And the bank said the balance as of that day was 5,000. It's going to stick this entry in and I'm going to want to delete it because it's not right. It's not properly reconciled. We need to reconcile it the right way. We need to put, if necessary, whatever beginning balance should have been on the books as of a statement date, not the last day it happened to be able to go to in the bank feeds, right? So... That's the first thing, and that's my little deep dive on, on just making sure that the accounts are reconciled. What we hope to see if we're at September 28th is that these are all reconciled through August, whatever the statement closing date is in the month of August, right? 
Then we get to accounts receivable. And of course, what I'm going to do there, and this is critically important to do with the client. I can't know what looks right and what doesn't look right here. I can only go by generic rules like, oh, anything over 90 days is probably a problem. But that may not, that often is not even the case, right, when you really get down to it. So let's go run the aging for accounts receivable. Summary. I don't need the detail yet. The client's going to know because the client's going to look at something like this and say, oh, yeah, Red Rock Diner, I, it's, we're, we're in discussions about it, whatever. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten that feedback from a client when I see something that's a little older like this. And they know the story because they know their business and they know their customers. So this is not a review I should ever do by myself. It's only a review I should ever do with the client looking at it with me. And I can't tell you how many times I can, I can feel the value of my stock skyrocketing in the client's eyes when I do something like this, because all of a sudden, the, the, the guaranteed almost, they haven't looked at this in forever, if ever at all. And they look at this and you'll see like negative amounts in here. And they'll start asking me, I don't know, why would there be an amount that's negative? And I tell them right away, it means one of two things. Either we have a payment that's missing an invoice that it needs to be married to, or we took a deposit from a customer. Instead of reporting it the right way and showing that as a liability, we took it in and, and just booked it as a payment on a customer and it creates a negative receivable which I explained to the client, depending on what our plans are, it may or may not matter. It may be fine, and it definitely makes your life simpler, keeping your books by just receiving the payment to the customer, letting it sit there as a negative until we are ready to invoice them. However, I explained to the client, if there's any chance that we're going to want a bank scrutinizing our books for the purposes of getting financing, or any other reason, an investor, somebody who may buy, or somebody who may buy in as part owner of the business, anything like that, anybody on the outside looking in, uh, who might potentially, for whatever reason, want to scrutinize the books, then we got to clean that stuff up, right? We can't leave it in there like this. And if my purpose is to eventually do forecasts for them, I also need to clean that up. I can't have that kind of stuff skewing my receivables because I'm going to want to put an assumption in my forecast about how long it takes typically to collect receivables, and that kind of stuff can throw it off. Now, here's the other thing that often comes up in this review is they'll see an invoice that's in here, and they'll say to me, hey, I know John Melton paid that invoice. And I'll say, great. And by now I've already confirmed the books are reconciled and there's no plug numbers, which means everything that passed through the bank account without a doubt is somewhere in these books. And when I can rely on that as the cornerstone of everything I'm doing, which by the way is why I don't plug a number, even if it's off by a penny, I find it and fix it because a penny could be a lot of money going one direction and one penny less going the other direction. And it just happens to net out right? I've shared the story many times, true story, where I had a situation, a client told me to plug the number because we're only off by $100, but it turns out, true story, 10,000 one way, 9,900 the other way, two totally unrelated transactions. And when you look at it from an auditor standpoint, what that really represents is a nearly $20,000 misstatement to the financial statements, right? So just because it nets out to what looks like a small number when you're off on a reconciliation doesn't mean it is. Therefore, I, 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 pl I don't plug in numbers. I don't tolerate plug numbers. It's simple math, beginning balance, plus additions minus subtractions equals ending balance. Somewhere in there is your difference. Something's missing, something's not in there for the right amount. Whatever it is, it can be found. These days you grab a CSV from the bank account, you download it, you can sort it, cut it, do whatever you need to do. In about 15 minutes, I can clear up any difference on a bank rack. No joke, 15 minutes, no more. So if he says that this is paid, then I know that that $450 payment is in here somewhere. It just didn't get coded right. Most likely, somebody recorded a deposit straight to income, ignored the fact that there was a receivable outstanding. So now we've duplicated income, overstated our receivables. Easy to find and fix though, right? And I just confirm with the client, do you know if he happened to pay the exact amount? Was it two payments that added up? Like, because I want to get a sense of how to approach searching for this, right? Most cases, it's straightforward. We find the amount. It's booked to income and to deposit, like I said. Very, very easy to fix. Another video for another day in case any of you watching, you know, doesn't immediately know how to fix something like that. Okay, so that's our accounts receivable review pretty simple. And a lot of times you'll be left with sort of homework, the stuff the client has to research and find out for you, right? In other cases, the client, like things like I just mentioned, you know, you can research that and fix it as long as you know that per the client, it was definitely paid. The other thing I always ask the client is that how did the client pay? Because I can't tell you how many times until I asked, I didn't get the answer. But the answer is that like the client paid cash and he never deposited it into the bank account. Well, duh. Okay. So now we need to record that 
payment and then show it as a deposit and zero it out to owner distributions or whatever. So uh, again, you have to sometimes ask a lot of questions to make sure you're getting the right information from the client to get the details that you need, okay? But this is how we do this review. Um, moving down the line, undeposited funds, inventory asset, I'll come back to. Undeposited funds, simple process. I'm just gonna go new, bank deposit. And I wanna confirm that anything sitting in undeposited funds is recent, right? These are from September 2nd. This is September 28th. That's already kind of a long time. I would be asking the client, hey, why hasn't this money been deposited yet? You know, it's been almost a month, right? So, so what gives, where's the, where's the money at? And just confirm that this amount here is actually equal to the amount that shows up on the balance sheet. Why might it be different? Somebody posts a journal entry and debits or credits undeposited funds. It makes me nuts when I see people do that. That should never happen. Journal entries just have no place ever being in undeposited funds. Um, inventory, all right? So inventory, we're gonna run a valuation summary report. Just to confirm, the other thing, by the way, when it comes to all these numbers, I didn't say this, but the most important reasonableness test is to ask the client the owner of the business, does this look right to you? Especially with the cash balances, they know, trust me, they know. Inventory, let's look at the valuation summary. And I'm gonna ask the client, does this look right to you? Do you think you have about $600 worth of inventory sitting in the warehouse? Again, they know their business. They know they have a better idea of this stuff than they realize until they start reviewing it with us. And again, that's where a lot of extra value comes in as a byproduct of doing these kind of processes with the client. So looking at this, and the bottom line is, I'll say, if, it, if he says, no, it doesn't look right, especially if he thinks it's way off, I'll say, great, take account, get back to me, right? That's the only way to clear up inventory, by the way, is to just take a physical count and adjust the inventory, period, dot, the end, that's all you can ever do, okay? And then, of course, when you post that inventory adjustment, you're going to hit your cost of goods sold account, call it shrinkage, call it inventory adjustments, whatever you want to call it, the offset needs to be cost of goods sold. Okay, um, so that takes care of inventory, undeposited funds, truck original cost. We can just go in here and see if we can get the bill of sale to confirm. This is a journal entry, so this looks like we we're putting it on the book. So again, this is something I could never resolve on my own. I need the client in here with me so I can ask the client, hey, when was this truck bought? And also, by the way, why is there no depreciation recorded on this? So you're not getting depreciation entries from your accountant? They probably are. They're probably not booking them, right? So we need to get that caught up, if anything, on something like this. Accounts payable, we're going to review the same way we do accounts receivable, right? We're just going to run that report. Let's go back to reports. And I'll go uh, aging. And this time it's the account payable aging summary. And again, reviewing with the client, something old, any reason we haven't paid this yet, right? Does this look right to you? Does it look, do you believe that you owe this money to people? Remember, especially with smaller businesses, the most significant internal control is the owner, his or herself, because everything passes through them when the business is that small, right? So really, really important um, to rely on the business owner as their own kind of internal control, right? They want their business uh, reported accurately. Okay, so again, check with the owner. If the owner says no way, there's no way we should have let PG&E, you know, go that long without getting it paid. So we confirm it. We find out maybe it was paid. And again, maybe we booked an expense directly to the expense account and forgot that there's a bill in here that it should have been applied to, right? Again, it's the complete inverse of what we look at when we're looking at accounts receivable. Moving down, credit cards, same as bank accounts. We just want to confirm they're reconciled and there's no plug numbers, right? Exactly the same process. As soon as I see stuff like this, Arizona Department of Revenue, Board of Equalization, payable, that means we've got sales taxes. So my first question to the client is, are you filing your sales tax returns? Who's filing your sales tax returns, right? Assuming this is a new client to me and I don't know, right? It's, if it's an existing client, then I'm probably making sure that the sales, I never file sales tax returns. It's either going to be Avalara or Texture or some such service. It's very rare that I actually file sales tax returns. Just not something I ever want to do. It's not interesting. It's not high. It's, it doesn't add much value from my perspective to the client. I'd much rather have the client pay a service to do it. Uh, loan payable. Again, think like an auditor. Reasonableness. Very, very even amount. That doesn't seem right. When I'm taking, when I'm making payments on a loan and there's interest and principal, it's very unlikely, other than the moment I initially got the loan, that you're going to see such an even amount in a loan payable account on the books. So again, we'd want to 
confer with the client on this and say, hey, I need statements from the bank. I need monthly statements. We need to confirm what the proper breakdown is of interest and principal. While you're at it, do you have the original loan documents? I'd love to take a look. I'd love to confirm what the APR is. I can do a reasonableness check and see. And also while I'm here, I might jump quickly over to the P&L just for a minute to confirm the, the very much related interest expense. Do I even see that on the books here? If there's a loan, there should be interest, right? And lo and behold, I don't see that, which actually kind of lines up because if I have this even amount, then I, it would make sense that I didn't have any interest expense booked yet. That would explain exactly why this is such an even amount. Same, of course, with notes payable. These are just being classified differently, obviously, because this is current, meaning we expect it to be paid off within a year. This is long term, meaning we expect it to take longer than a year to pay it off, right? And then the equity section, the only thing to do here, which is something you should do with every new client anyway, is get a copy of the last filed tax return, run the balance sheet as of that same date, and then you can just do the check and make sure that the equity on the balance sheet of the tax return equals the equity for the same year end date uh, in QuickBooks Online here. And many of you already know that if it doesn't match up, I have a whole trial balance adjustment template and video that makes it easy for you to walk through the tax to books differences and come up with the adjustment that needs to be posted in order to force the books into agreement with the tax return. And then you do kind of a partial reversal of that adjustment um, on January 1st, the following year, or the next day of the fiscal year, whatever that is. Um, in order to reverse the things that are just based on timing differences, things like, you know, the bank account balances and credit card account balances that a lot of times we may have used the, um, the bank statements as the ending balance on the tax return, even though we really should use the book balance. But anyway, another story for another day. So again, getting back to it before we can really get into, and, and actually I consider this kind of a process to be very much within the wheelhouse of advisory services. Because I can promise you, along the way as you do, do a review like this, and especially when and as you do it with the client, you're going to get a lot of advice is going to come up. The client's going to ask a lot of questions. And I promise you, by the end of that hour, or whatever it actually takes to get through that review with the client, it's the first time it's going to take a little longer because there's going to be probably a lot more cleanup to do. Um, once it's clean, this kind of an analysis usually doesn't take more than maybe even half an hour, once a month, charge accordingly. But because it's a high value, forget about the time it takes, it's high, high value when you start doing this kind of stuff with your client. I have clients I do this with that almost every week, one of the clients I do this with weekly, and he pays accordingly, um, he asks me every week. It's like he forgets the answer or maybe he's just fascinated by how valuable the process is because these are the remarks he makes to me. And he'll say to me, he'll say, Seth, do you do this with all your clients? And I'm honest with him. I say, only the ones who are willing to pay me for, you know, for the value that they're getting out of it. And because uh, he always remarks how much, how much easier it makes his life and mine, frankly, because as we're doing this all year, guess what happens? Our year end process is so much more simplified. But again, what this really does and, and what I really want to speak to here in the series is in terms of advisory services, it cues me in several levels deeper than I normally might go and it cues the client in several levels deeper. Between the two of us, we're in sync. And again, it, it, it opens up the door for all kinds of dialogue that would never happen otherwise. And inside of that dialogue is gonna be all kinds of advice, which is what advisory services is truly going to be all about. It's about giving the client advice. And the only basis on which an accounting professional can give a client advice is having sound financial data, like what we just went through to review with the client. And first and foremost, make sure that it's accurate and bulletproof. And then second, start looking at it from the analytical side. And that's what I'll get into in the coming weeks as I do this. I do plan on doing this every Monday night, 6 p.m. I'll go live on the Facebook page. I'll share it to the, uh, the, the Facebook group accounting business academy i'm looking online it looks like some people are watching but i don't see any comments so with that i'm going to bid you all an absolutely fantastic night and keep your eyes open because i'm going to do another facebook live on thursday at 9 a.m pacific that one i'm calling the cash flow call so that one we're going to do we're just going to talk about cash flow because to me the advisory service piece of things always is going to come down to cash flow and monitoring cash flow and analyzing cash flow and constantly looking for newer and better ways to improve cash flow. 
And remember one thing that's important along those lines, sales solve most problems, right? Because the more we can bring sales in, the more the cash flow comes in. And that's the important way for cash flow to come in is through sales, through operations, not financing and investing activities, right? Those, if our cash flows are coming from financing and investing activities, it's not sustainable necessarily. There's only so much money I'm gonna put into the company before it goes belly up, right? Ultimately, we need cash flows coming in from operations. So tune in with me every Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific, every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific. And, uh, and we're going to go live and we're going to talk about this stuff. And don't forget, if you ever want to find out more about my Bulletproof CFO program, then just comment below if you're interested and I'll give you a link where you can schedule a 15 minute call. We can see if it makes sense. If we agree that it makes sense, we'll do a one hour strategy call where I'll take a good look with you at your accounting or bookkeeping practice and we'll see what it takes to get you out of compliance and into advisory services as quickly as possible. And don't get me wrong, you can do both, but I think you're gonna find the more you get into the advisory, the more you get into the high ticket CFO type services, the more you're gonna find it so much more enjoyable on so many levels. Forget about the fact that you make more money. The work is much more interesting. You're almost going to want to say, you know what, client, go hire your own bookkeeper or you'll hire one to put on them, you know, make the money on that. But your focus will be on the high ticket advisory services. It's so much better. So anyway, I hope you're all having an absolutely fantastic evening. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday morning. And don't forget also Wednesday is our weekly Bulletproof Bookkeeping webinar, but not this Wednesday because it's the fifth week of the month, which means a nerd's got to take a break. So, so next Wednesday, we'll pick up again with Bulletproof Bookkeeping webinars, 1 p.m. Pacific. And of course, every Friday, I'm still doing the Zoom every Friday. I forgot what this Friday's topic is. Just go to the events page on my website and you can register for that and a lot of the other things that I'm doing. So you know where to find me if you have any questions. I will see you all around the web.